<laughs> All right, so um, wanted to kick this off because, you know, um, being able to grow sales in a business, I still feel like regardless of you're able to elevate yourself from doing all the tactical work yourself, it's still a critical function, especially at our stage that we still all have to fulfill. And so when I was, I think about 24 years old, I had built my first business. It was doing a couple million dollars in sales. It was an e-commerce business, selling a lot of kind of dropship products. Um, at one point I had the, the great idea of creating a little Excel macro thing that basically pulled down all the products and shot out uh, Google AdWords campaigns. And so this was all great until I did it on 11,000 products and I had no idea what was working and what was not working. And so I started realizing that overall it started not working. And so I ended up with basically $100,000 on my American Express bill that I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay this. I was like, the profit's not coming in. And so I was like running all these ads like this is not working. And so at that time, I had only known how to run ads. I had learned some SEO stuff. And then I was like, how am I going to get out of this? And so then I started looking in, I don't know what got the idea, but I started looking in like, okay, I built all these customers. Um, how do I get them to buy more stuff that doesn't cost me any money? I don't have to spend money on ads. So that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of copywriting. Then I went to like internet marketing stuff where they talked about funnels and landing pages and all that kind of stuff. And that kind of changed everything for me. And so over 10 years, I probably went through every copywriting book you could imagine, went through all the pages, tried all the formulas, all the courses I could find, all the live events, all that stuff, applied it in four or five different businesses and really kind of cut my teeth on like doing that stuff. And so I think of any skill in business, that's probably where I am most competent. Most stuff I'm not that competent, <laughs> managing people, you know, anything like that is a, not my specialty. But in terms of taking a business and wherever it's at now and finding a critical path to grow sales, that's where I think I can do that pretty well. And so I want to kind of cover what I think are the three most important tools for everyone to be able to do that in your business so you can unlock sales growth. And I know a lot of people in here, we're going to talk about some Amazon stuff and that, but I've kind of, after we kind of got the feedback on the type forms, I modified a little bit of this presentation to make it more focused on, because a lot of people are like, how do I improve my funnels? How do I get my, I know you want to get your Facebook ads working better. How do I get my pages converting better? So we can do a lot of that stuff in hot seats, but you're going to get some of the underlying principles in this presentation. So this is not that important right now. <laughs> this is a work in progress, but um, trying to build out this framework from how do I go from like a person who's running a business as a CEO that the business is doing well, but it's kind of like, I'm not a hundred percent comfortable. It's not making me completely financially free. I don't feel like I could walk away for a month and everything would be fine down to the bottom right, which is like, I can run almost an unlimited number of businesses because I'm not the person who has to run them. If I don't want to, they're all doing well, at least collectively predictable cash flow, um, run by good people. How do we get from there to here? So that's kind of like what I want to have built out as we do this mastermind. So this unlocking sales growth, still an important part of this. It actually ends up fitting kind of right there. And so we're jumping ahead a little bit, but I still think this is an important skill for everyone to build. So the tools we're going to talk about, contrast, using what people don't expect to increase sales, two, social proof, which I think is the easiest way to sell more, um, to convert higher. Then third, scarcity. And these are all kind of wired into us, whether we like them or not. And so kind of in this 40 minutes, you're going to learn how to exploit, for lack of a better word, these psychological quirks to get people to buy more stuff. And we'll talk about why there's an important qualifier there um, so you don't end up miserable. So these tools are kind of like knives, in my opinion. A knife can be used by a surgeon to help heal somebody or they can be used by somebody to kill somebody. And sort of how you use them is up to you. There's a lot of people who use these same tools to sell people garbage, to screw people over, and that's obviously not what we're here for. That's why I say we kind of try to filter people in here so that these are good people selling good products. I mean, they wanna help people with breast cancer. I know everyone in here has some noble cause in your business, whether it's explicit or not. That's what I've gotten when all the sort of filtering we've done to get everyone in here. So I'm confident you're gonna use these things for the right reasons, but these same things can be used to screw people over. Let's not get that wrong. I and mean, people do all day long. So it's up to you to make sure while you're using these tools, you use them in a good way. Because these things are not just sort of marketing tactics that came out of nowhere. They're built in kind of taking advantage of almost loopholes in our own psychology. Because, you know, through thousands of years, we kind of built up that if a bunch of people are running away from some lions charging at you, you should probably start running. 
not sit there and kind of evaluate, oh, why are they running? Are they running for a good reason? It's like, no, you just start running and worry about that later. And so because of that and a whole lot of other similar things, if uh, people see a lot of people buying a product or you kind of engineer it to make it look like a lot of people are buying a product, they're going to be more likely to want to buy the product because of the same psychological wiring. So you're kind of taking advantage of some of these loopholes, but doing it, and this part is up to you, in a good way. One thing to always consider is don't sell anything you wouldn't buy yourself. This is from Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, who's the only people I pull quotes from. <laughs> uh, but don't sell anything you wouldn't buy yourself. If you do this, this is gonna solve probably 90% of your problems. If you're selling a good product and you know you're not gonna cross the boundary into lying and that kind of thing, then everything else is probably gonna be fine. You're selling a good product, people might as well buy your product, they're gonna buy anybody's product, so everything's all good. So if you're always looking at this, then you're probably gonna be fine. I know this because I have not always done that. Um, early on in my supplement business, I was selling a lot of people's different products, and then Dr. Oz, this guy right here, would do every week. He had some new weight loss supplement that was gonna cure everyone's problems. You just take the pill and you're done. Um, I think most of them didn't actually work, or maybe they worked in some really small edge case or something like that, but these products would just explode on Amazon. They're natural. They're not like some crazy pharmaceutical that I don't think is gonna like necessarily hurt anybody, but they weren't products I necessarily believed in. And so I found out over time, using these same tools, that at first, if you're so excited about like making money and learning marketing and all that kind of stuff, you could probably get away with a while for using these tools on products that at least you're know, not completely crossing like an ethical boundary, but maybe you just don't believe in a lot. Um, I did that for a little while, but I eventually found out like this is not fun. Like it's not fun selling this stuff, using these tools um, to sell stuff I don't really believe in. And so it's much better to sell a product you do believe in because I think it also makes you more effective. The more you believe in your product, the easier it is for you to actually sell the product. Um, the reason we sold lots of ASM, for example, is because we really believed in the product. I bought every course out there, I went through all of them, all that kind of stuff, so we had this deep conviction and we saw what it did for people. And so when you're in that position, it makes it way easier to sell products. So principle number one is contrast. Using what people don't expect to increase sales. So the first part about this, let's talk about the product, creating contrast in your product. Monster Energy, I don't know if anybody saw um, my post about this, but I actually read 25 years of annual reports for Monster Energy, which probably sounds a little insane, <laughs> saying that out loud. Uh, each one's like 200 pages. <laughs> At some point, you know, like maybe like 50% of it's like boilerplate, I'm not literally reading the same, you know, but it's probably easily thousands and thousands of pages. And so I read this because I was curious, this company today has a market cap of about $50 billion. I was like, how did it become a $50 billion company? And it does, about $6 billion in sales. I still don't get why it's valued that much of a multiple of sales, but either way, $6 billion in sales, $50 billion in market cap, either way, it's done really well. I was like, how did it do this? And because it's a public company, you could just go read. And so you start going to sec.gov or wherever, and you start downloading all these things and uh, printing them like I do, uh, and you can read them, you can find out. And so I read from like 97 all the way up to like 2022. And so what I found out is that one of their big innovations is, you know, there's a few things to learn here that I'll kind of cover relatively quickly. They started off as a juice company back in the day. And so it started off as like a natural juice company. This guy was schlepping his juices around California and stuff. That business started in like 1930s or something, ends up kind of going bankrupt. Uh, these guys buy it out of bankruptcy, still selling juices. And then around 97-ish, they start kind of figuring out like, hey, these kind of like people are kind of into these energy drinks. So they create these like juice energy drink products under this Hanson's brand. And then they're kind of like, hey, people are really into these energy drinks. And so they ended up creating, uh, they wanted some unique product in that space. And so they're doing kind of this focus group and they're like, they find out from their accountant, I think, that hey, if we double the can size, because everyone was doing like the eight ounce Red Bull sort of size, and they found out if they doubled the can size, it didn't really increase their cost that much, but now it was double the size of the product, double the value, but almost no extra cost. And they did this focus group and this guy was like, man, this can is like a monster. And so that's kind of how they came up with a name. And so their big innovation was doubling the can size, basically the same ingredients. So I would say doubling the can size, plus also having this kind of extreme branding really stands out. And so they would say time and time again that they would, I, don't, I actually don't know if the product looked the same when they first launched it, but in every one of their annual reports, they would say for all of their products, they're constantly looking at like, what does this product look like? What does the packaging look like? What is, what's gonna make it stand out? Because you think about their main source of sales has been from the beginning and till now has been retail. And so you don't have a long sales page in retail. All you have is what the product looks like. But I think that's a big factor on Amazon as well. And I think if we ever wanna go to retail, we also have to be looking at it. But either way, having 
a product that stands out. In their case, it was literally just doubling the size. They needed some contrast. It's a bigger can and more extreme design. Another example, boxed water. Despite what they say, they just put water in a box. And so, but it works. You think about once again in a retail environment, same thing applies online, something different. They're not innovating, you know, some world's new fancy water. Um, I think even people that say that are probably just regular water. But in their case, they literally just put water in a box. And I think it's, you know, they're kind of saying it's more environmentally friendly, which is great. Um, but also it just kind of stands out and makes it look different. So when you're thinking about your product, it's like, what are you gonna do that's gonna make it different than what everyone else is doing? Because if you're doing the same stuff, then it's probably not gonna sell as well as it possibly could. Death Wish Coffee is another one. Kind of unique value proposition. You know, the world's strongest coffee. They went extreme on an angle, and we talked about this a little bit before, that if you can go really extreme on a feature or angle, that's another way you can make your product stand out, as opposed to just getting mixed in there with everyone else. It's like, how do you make it the something? The strongest, the biggest, the smallest, the lightest, the highest quality, the most expensive. Any of those kind of factors is a way you can carve out a niche for almost any product out there. Um, I've heard before from an investor, I haven't looked at this myself, but uh, he's saying like Ferrari, you know, they make tons and tons and tons of money, but they only sell, you know, not that many cars per year versus like a mass market brand like Toyota or Hyundai or whatever. Like they make more money than them and they sell a limited number because they have this super expensive car. Doesn't mean we should all get in that sort of space, but that's the same way of looking at it. It's like if you have something where you can make your product really stand out at the extreme on some feature set, that's another way to make the product stand out. Um, this is a pan that uh, I think Kylie's bought a couple of these. She's bought them for my mom's. And so they've done extremely well. They sell this pan for quite a bit more than other ones. And so um, for them, you know, having this kind of unique design, I don't buy a lot of kitchen gear, but from what I know, <laughs> most pans don't look like this. So it's a little bit more of a unique design uh, their value proposition was basically going hard on the sort of the non-stick angle. And so creating a product inside of a generic space, most just kind of black pans that nobody's that excited about, they created this brand that's absolutely exploded by making it different. So it's like any time you look at your current products and you're like, why is this thing not selling as well as it could? It's usually not because you're not getting the right traffic or you're not buying traffic at the right place. It's usually because the product's not exciting enough. It's not different enough. It doesn't fill a niche in that space enough. And so that's the first thing to look at, is making sure you have a product that actually stands out. Life Boost for us, we've tried to make the packaging a little bit more unique than what other people do. I mean, one thing for us, does this red thing? Doesn't really show up on the screen. But you see how we have those little logos down there at the bottom. We've put more copy in our bag than I think most people do. Now, online, I think we can get away with this. If we go to retail, we may have to take some of that back a little bit for compliance and that sort of thing. But for now, we're like, hey, nobody put sales copy on the bag. We're going to put sales copy on the bag. Um, Charles is also in love with these birds on the left and stuff. So he's insisted on having these birds. <laughs> I'm less sold on the birds. But at least the, br the branding and packaging and stuff looks somewhat different. But for us, you know, the value proposition, I think, has probably been a bigger driver. Low acid, super clean coffee. We don't care about all these things that David knows about with tasting notes and this and that. Um, that's not what it's about. It's not for those kind of people. It's for regular people who want really good coffee that's as clean as possible. Specifically, you know, the most loyal sort of raving fan customers are the ones who want lower acidity coffee that's easy on their stomach. Um, so that's kind of been our value proposition. So the first thing when it comes to contrast in your business is having a product that actually stands out. So a few ways to do that. Colors is an easy one. Um, using a unique color palette that's not going to blend in. Packaging putting your product in a packaging that looks and feels different. A lot of cases, I feel like this is enough to, is almost to win in almost any space um, if other people are not doing this very well. If you take a packaging that you know, maybe costs you a dollar or two, and you get a packaging that costs you like three bucks or something, all of a sudden you've got this unique packaging that could possibly stand out amongst everyone else. Always something to look at. Ideally, you could do it for the same cost, but at least having a packaging that's somewhat different is not a bad way to go. Features, like I said, take an extreme stance on one feature or value, like Death Wish going extreme on making the coffee as strong as possible. I order some, it tastes terrible. I don't know how people drink that stuff, but maybe they just dump like cream and stuff in there and maybe it's fine, I don't know, not for me. Uh, but it's for a lot of people, they sell a lot, it's good for them. Uh, size, biggest, smallest, lightest, heaviest, kind of going back to the monster, they literally double the can size. And that's not the only thing. You can't be like, oh yeah, now you know they do 16 ounce, I'm gonna do a 32 ounce energy drink, and all of a sudden I'm gonna crush it. It's like there's a lot more that goes into there, obviously, but that innovation early is sort of what kickstarted all their growth. Then they had to back it up with all the other good stuff, all the other branding and all that sort of things. But 
without that one piece, they would have had nothing that stood out. I mean, they already had energy drinks. They weren't working that well. They were doing okay, just because the whole energy drink market was lifting up. But as soon as they had this innovation, that's when their business exploded. Which is why, like them, for example, they were launching from 97 until now, they were launching at least 10 products a year, um, maybe up to 20. And some of those were variations. So they weren't all new products. Bigger size, higher uh, can count, different flavors. And so they kind of took the stance early on. They never knew what was really going to hit. So they kind of almost like a machine were launching probably 10 products a year. But they were always self-funded. So it's not like they were raising a bunch of debt or putting themselves in some crazy financial situation. Sometimes they had more profits. Sometimes they had less. Once they found their big winner, they almost didn't have enough use of the cash. They were spitting off so many cash, so much cash. But to get there, they were launching probably like 10 products a year or so. Now, also on contrast, ads and content. So there's kind of two ways to make ads work. Um, you can blend in or you can stand out. This is why in email marketing, this is my actually one of my Klaviyo accounts, I always have an email template that looks like this, and I use it almost exclusively. I call it the Gmail lookalike super signatures, this thing I got from the internet marketing part person, this is not really that important. The Gmail lookalike is the important part. I try to make my marketing email, because it comes from me. So if you're sending an email from your brand, this may not work as well, but if you use your, yourself, your name, like it's coming from a real person, I want that to look and feel like an email that's like a Gmail email. So when I design that email template, I'll sit there with a Gmail email open, I'll sit there with Klaviyo open, I'm like, how do I make this look as similar as possible? Um, and so I push the unsubscribe down a little bit, nothing excessive. I still want people to be unsubscribed because I don't want to have email deliverability issues, but I don't want an unsubscribe button that's like blinking in orange, like staring at them in their face because that doesn't look like a normal email. So it's still there, you can still access it, no problem. But more importantly, I make the formatting of the font as close as possible to Gmail. So this is blending in. So using an email marketing all the time. The other way that we're gonna spend more, talk, more time talking about is standing out. Two principles. If you can blend in and make it feel like a native ad, um, that works fine. Um, but if you can also make it stand out, that's good too. What you don't wanna do is get caught somewhere in the middle where it's just boring. This is Snoop Dogg. <laughs> in case you didn't know. <laughs> so back in the day, obviously very popular rapper, everyone knows who Snoop Dogg is. If you wanted to be a popular rapper today, what should you do to stand out? I know a guy who figured it out. This is not an ethical guy. This is not a guy we want life lessons from, but he's done well in marketing. He went from nothing to like top of the charts. Today's rapper, also went to jail after for things we don't need to talk about, <laughs> but it's this guy. <laughs> if you want to be a rapper in the 90s, you look like this. If you want to stand out today on social media, you look like this. Nobody has a colored grill, nobody has rainbow hair, not many people that are 17 are tattooing their face, um, but it's a way to stand out, and it worked. I mean, this guy posting on social media, calling out other rappers, stands out, and so he blew up. He made some bad ethical and life decisions, <laughs> but beyond that, he really did well in terms of selling his actual music, which is not particularly that good in my opinion, and I like rap music. Another guy, Devin's favorite, uh, he's a smart guy, Definitely knows his marketing, wrote a great book, a lot of good direct marketing stuff. If y'all want to pick it up, not a bad choice, $100 million offers. <clears throat> He's not doing videos in a dress like me. Uh, <laughs> his viewership, I think, would tank a lot. But when this guy is sitting here spouting off, you know, good marketing advice, good business advice, but he looks like a lumberjack, and a lot of times he has his like, nose strip on, because I guarantee you he's seen that those videos get a lot more views than if he is. He's been clean shaven here and there. Those videos are not the ones you find if you just search them on social media, because these ones blow up. These guys are good at standing out on social media, and I think that's what you have to do. So this is a Dollar Shave Club. They ended up selling for a billion dollars to Unilever uh, four years after this ad went out. So this ad has 28 million views. Um, these guys and the guys behind them, I think it's the Harmon Brothers, very good at creating you know, uh, video creative. I'm not saying you have to go all the way there, but they created this sort of comedy sketch kind of video for a razor blade company, that the razor blades are probably the same as everyone else, is why would they say? Uh, but this ad stood out, very different than what everyone else had. So this thing works. This is a snow teeth whitening, uh, teeth whitening brand that has done very well. Pretty much all of their ads that do well have uh, some influencer people, usually, sometimes athletes or celebrities, whoever they're using, always have this glowing thing in their mouth standing out. So it's rather than just somebody with a great smile saying, this thing whitened my teeth, they have this blue glowing thing sticking in their mouth because this is going to stand out when you're scrolling on social media. Other people, I'm sure, are probably ripping it off now and stuff, but they were some of the first ones to really push that. And so 
that thing is going to stand out in your ads. Uh, and this is, for example, I pulled Oral B. Look at the two different ads. It's like one looks super boring. Um, in terms of click through rate and everything else like that, this one's absolutely, absolutely going to dominate. That one's going to do probably mediocre, but they're building a big brand. So, <clears throat> ours, somebody was asking, maybe it was Mike the other day. Yeah, Mike was like, how do you get great creative? I need to get some you know, fancy videographers and whatever. This is 100% stock photography. I believe this is our ad that um, we've sent the most money to in the last seven days. Uh, and this literally just a headline. We've tested a lot of stuff. So it's not like we just came out of this out of nowhere. But has a picture on the left of some moldy coffee person on the right holding their stomach. Regardless, whether this would work for you or not, it's something to try. Um, but it's not boring. It stands out. It's not kind of like your normal kind of Facebook post. You used to probably not even be able to get away with this on Facebook. But Facebook got a hell of a lot more lenient over the past few years. Uh, so this kind of thing works. It's great. And then this is our, I think, probably second highest traffic ad. I don't have the video in here. It doesn't really matter. It's just pouring this kind of coffee drink. This is a stock video also. I don't think we didn't shoot this ourselves. So this is another one that's working extremely well. It just stands out. Close-up video of food, you know, sort of makes sort of taps into that primal sort of hunger. <laughs> I like seeing food that tastes good and stuff. Um, it may not be helping people with, you know, weight loss stuff, but uh, <laughs> either way, there's a stock video. You got a question? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Do you have the, the same person that does your ads uh, takes care of the media of the ads? Yeah. So somebody. Separate? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So somebody asked that. So um, <clears throat> our only job for the ads is, I mean, this this headline, by the way. I wrote this headline, we've never been able to beat this. This was in the first like beginning of 2019, I wrote a bunch of ads and stuff, this headline, because this headline is another part of standing out. And so other than that, that's stayed the same, um, we, our only job is to send him raw content. Meaning like if we do a product photo shoot, we send him those nice videos and photos and stuff. Uh, if we have customers that we get testimonials from, we send him those, everything else he does. Because he needs to be able to iterate so fast, because we're spending a good amount of money um, on Facebook ads, so he needs to be able to iterate so fast that to me, in my opinion, um, nobody in here owns a Facebook ad agency, right? Okay, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> is that if they're kind of telling you like, oh yeah, you know, you need to create these like finished sort of ads for us, finished little videos, finished little things, I probably wouldn't use them. Because if they're, they're constantly gonna be blaming you because you're not giving them stuff fast enough, they should be creating all that stuff themselves. Uh, because they need to move so fast create so many different options because it's so cheap to test these things that that should be their job. So that is his job. So he'll create all these variations. I never gave him anything that looked anything like this. Um, I had a couple ads at the beginning, but those are not the ones that ended up winning later on other than the text part. Um, this video, we found early on, because one of our early ads that was working really well was the same copy and stuff that I had written, but then it was like just a close-up picture of a piece of chocolate cake getting cut. And so that gave us ideas. The Dalgona coffee thing exploded on TikTok. These close-up little coffee videos of this delicious-looking coffee getting made, something similar to this. That blew up. So that gave us an idea. Hey, we should do these close-up videos of like little tasty-looking coffee drinks. Um, so that was it. And he kind of ran with it. And he's tested probably hundreds of variations of that kind of thing. But he does all that stuff himself. And I think that's how it should be because they need to move fast. And it's kind of like with these agencies, like the more you can put the responsibility on them, I think the better. Because if they're constantly pointing fingers of like, oh, you didn't give me what I need, um, I think that's not a good position to be in. Because it's never really clear. Uh, but it's like, if it's like 90% on them and you gave them the 10%, and then it's kind of like, hey, they're either doing good or not. So <clears throat> that was a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> uh, so I think the overall rule of this is don't be boring. My number one rule of advertising. This is my number one feedback. And I've given the feedback internally in the companies. Every person we've ever hired to do any social media stuff, this is me complaining to Callie, complaining to Mike, and then maybe sometimes I'll eventually tell them. Um, but this is the thing where people always get wrong. It's like they create these ads, they're like, it doesn't work, but it looks like some boring corporate thing. I'm like, that's why it doesn't work. I was like, you don't need to do that. We don't own a you know, billion dollar company where we have to check with like 17 layers of like legal um, people to, to approve anything. As long as it's good, it's like you're not, not um, breaking any rules, uh, you're just doing something that stands out, then it's fine. If you were selling a weight loss supplement, and you're doing like a before and after, I'd be a hell of a lot more careful. i look through Facebook ad policies, possibly talk with an attorney, but as long as you're not jumping into something that's like that extreme, then anything else that just stands out, kind of shocks people is probably fine. Um, so number one rule of advertising, don't be boring because of that contrast principle. So principle number two, or tool number two, is social proof. You wanna make buying from you the normal thing for people to do. 
So this is a video actually I have to play. Let's see, I think it's gonna open a new tab here. I tested this yesterday. In the blue t-shirt, that is Nadia. She is an innocent passerby. Has nothing to do with this. Everybody else in that elevator, they all work for, would you call for that? They are all in on the experiment. They are all purposefully facing the wrong way. Nadia is facing the front. You can just see the back of her head. Wearing the blue t-shirt, that's Nadia. She is facing the front of the elevator like a normal human being. Everybody else is facing the back. We're playing this to you in real time, no editing, as it actually happens. Okay, floor two. Rebecca gets off, Emily gets on, she also works for us. <laughs> We're swapping people in and out to reinforce the behavior. Emily's acting like it's the most normal. <laughs> okay, her bag is slipping off her shoulder, she's nervously playing with it. Nadia is now halfway round. <laughs> Emily gets off, Mike gets off. Again, Mike works for the show. Presses his button, faces the back like it's the most normal thing in the world, like he does it every day. Nadia is really feeling the pressure right now. I'm not missing anyone else. Did you to make some small talk? He was in celebrity rehab, I think. She's looking towards the back of the elevator, because everybody else is. Floor four. Fourth floor, Mike gets off, Lauren gets on, Lauren also works for us. She's in. Oh, and Nadia, 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 Nadia has turned all the way around. She's looking at the back of the elevator. That is not normal human behavior. Nadia is looking at the back of the elevator purely because everybody else is. Okay, you've seen it in real time. Let's play that for you again. It fast forward. Nadia, turning, 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 turning. Turn. So that is uh, <clears throat> social proof in a nutshell. Um, even if people are doing something completely stupid, they'll follow it just if it's a normal thing to do. <laughs> uh, so I heard about the study, but I never found the video until recently. But I find it like super interesting. So <clears throat> same thing, you know, Jaws movie scene. If a bunch of people are running out of the ocean, like in South Africa, because there's a shark out there and Brandon's surfing, uh, you're probably going to run out of the ocean and worry about asking questions later. So. Um, you know, it's basically doing something because a lot of other people are doing it. And so how do you build social proof? How do you engineer it into your business? Amazon reviews um, on Amazon is obviously more believable because it's a third party platform on your Shopify store, still very important because it's like, if a product has, you know, one review and it's like two stars versus like uh, that always pan has like 30,000 reviews in their store, that's pretty good stars. You're like, they would have had to go really far to fake 30,000 reviews. Uh, maybe they used ChatGPT and sort of popped them in there, but it's kind of at some point you're like, I don't 100% trust it, but I like pretty much trust it. And so in your Shopify store, it matters a lot. Social media profiles matters a lot. So getting raw reviews count, super important. Your bestsellers rank itself is a form of social proof. I think Miguel was saying it with the Amazon's choice badge. That's what your sales are. Yeah, so that's another kind of form of social proof, kind of also third party endorsement. Sales count. <clears throat> this is something that I find interesting because I think most of us don't do it well enough. Uh, we've done it off and on with Amazing. We've done it with Life Boost. You know, we kind of made a big deal when we sold our millionth bag. Um, but if you add, uh, because most of our orders are three bags, and so we could have said our you know three hundred thousandth order or something like that. But millionth bag sounds better. It's more of a milestone. And so, I mean, in your case, selling supplements or anybody selling supplements, you could use something like, hey, we've had this many customers is one way. This many orders is another way. <clears throat> you could take the number of servings that you've sold. This many servings, um, obviously say something that's ethical, true and stuff, but yeah, I don't know if you'd wanna say like, <clears throat> this many servings enjoyed or something because you don't know if they actually took them, but something along those lines where you have this massive number of people like, oh yeah, that's great. You know, now I'm on somebody else's landing page. I don't know if they've done that much. And so this is the thing we should all be sort of tracking these things and using them just as another third party endorsement. Make it feel like they're not the first person to ever buy from you. It's kind of what you want to do. So using something like that is good. Uh, types of reviews, and I'll go through some examples on our landing page, but varying the types 
You could literally have the same review from the same person, but one is written, take, take, if you get like a video testimonial, take that, make it written, now you have a written version, now you have a video one, the two different parts on the page, it just looks like more stuff, but it's also somebody's like not gonna watch the video or somebody's not gonna read, so it's totally fine. So the different types of social proof is good. Uh, details, this is super important. Um, you may wanna get approval before you use some of this stuff, but the more details you can add to reviews, the more believable they are. So you could say it's like, you know, random customer loves this product, or you can have like Mary loves this product, or Mary C from Austin, Texas loves this product. Um, those all get more believable. And it really depends on your niche also, because um, if you have somebody that you know is like a doctor and you're selling a health product, that's gonna be even better review than just some random person. But having the more details regardless is still good. Uh, you know, the kind of ad trick that you've seen everyone do, you've, at least you've seen it online, where they'll be like, um, uh, what do they say? They'll, they'll say, oh, we've got a great deal for people in Texas or people in Austin. It's because they're geo-targeting you. Uh, that also works because you're like, oh, this person's like me. And so if there's any way you can engineer that, that's good. But if you're selling mass market online, it may not really fit. To me, the good option there is just to vary the testimonials. So if you know that your business like Safer Life Boost is like 60% female, 40% male, then we want to make sure we have testimonials from all of them. Or if we want to target a younger demographic, we're going to specifically, for that landing page, pull our reviews from people that look younger. But maybe still have some other ones mixed in there because we may get other people visiting the page. But that's also important. People are going to believe reviews from people like them more than they will from just other random people. So engineering that's good also. Visibility, putting these things everywhere is a good idea. You almost can't have enough social proof. Uh, ads, landing pages, product pages, checkout, follow-up emails. You almost cannot have enough of these um, throughout your entire funnel. Like I said, they always pan 32,000 reviews. We'll post these slides. I'll try to even remember to do it tonight. Just post them in the Facebook group. Uh, but y'all get them either way. So um, but if you want to take pictures, that's cool. So 32,000 reviews in their store. At some point, it's kind of like, this is probably pretty legit. This also indicates how much this product is sold. Um, this product has sold a lot to get 32,000 reviews, even on Shopify. This is native deodorant. They write this as another model you can kind of copy. It has over 50,000 five-star reviews. We've used something similar. I think I even have a picture of it. <clears throat> but we say over like 13,000 five-star reviews. Um, you can also use that depending on your context. It's like, if it's like an, uh, a chunk on your landing page about your brand, you can just put the total number of five-star reviews you've had in your entire store. If it looks like it's about the product, you want to be honest, because otherwise it'll be kind of misleading. If you're like, it's had 15,000 five-star reviews, but that's your whole business, not just that one product. So use it in the right context. But if you're talking about your overall brand, then over 50,000 five-star reviews means you've made a lot of people happy. So that's good. Uh, this is our product, uh, one of our landing pages. So over 13,743 five-star reviews. This is another example of specificity. It'd be better if we had some little script in there or whatever that pulled that dynamically. Um, but either way, we just kind of manually put it in there. We'll do an accurate count at that time. And then maybe if we remember to update it, we do. But either way, having a specific number is more believable because we know it's higher than this because uh, that was at a snapshot in time. So this is going to be more believable than just putting 13,000 reviews, like even like natives or whatever. They may have a reason they're doing that. They're smart. They've done a lot of good marketing. Uh, but I think it's slightly more believable the more specific it is. This is an example of us using a specific uh, last initial plus um, state that she's in. And so this is another way of making the review more believable. So this is kind of some of our landing page social proof. This is when I was kind of seeing the feedback of like, oh, I want to improve my landing page performance. I want to improve my funnel. This is kind of the, some specific stuff that I added afterwards. So I counted them and we have 56 fully visible reviews. These are not reviews you have to scroll through. These are not reviews you have to expand. These are just visible, just scrolling. So we have 56 fully visible reviews on the landing page. Um, we have one that's just text only, just the one that's kind of at the top you can kind of see over there on the right. We have 25 that have a photo plus text. We have 15 that are like a star rating plus text, kind of like Amazon style review or just kind of what you would see on the uh, store page. We have 14 featured in our video. We had at one point, we paid this company to basically do like a demo at a farmer's market and they captured all these people on video. So there's basically 14 people that end up being featured in there. Uh, so that's kind of like the total number of reviews that we have on this landing page. I think that's a big reason, in addition to all the good copy and stuff, I think this is a big reason why this has worked. Because at some point, if you do all this stuff, it's a pro if it's a product they actually want, which we talked about, if you drive home that you've got a ton of people that have been happy using it, 
and you have a guarantee that's kind of like, hey, if you try this out and you don't like it, we'll give you your money back. Why would somebody not buy it? Um, because at that point, there's no reason not to. And so that's what I think you're trying to engineer. That's why I say social proof is probably the most important and easiest way to make your landing page work better. It's like, if you have reviews on your page now, what happens if you increase that by like 5x? And also using diversity, not just more drowning it out text reviews, but mixing up the format, adding more specificity, peppering them throughout the page. Um, I think that can't hurt performance. So get more social proof for your brand, set up review automation. Mike and these guys can probably talk about this better for Amazon. We use different tools. There's lots of them. Pretty much everyone here probably is using some tool on Shopify that kind of automates collecting reviews. Uh, friends and family, still not a bad way. If you've got friends and family, you're just wanna like, how do I get photos? Like get some friends and family to use the product, get ones that are actually happy with the product and get them for uh, photos and maybe even videos. That's another way to like fill that bucket. If you get five of those, that's a good start and then you can get them from you know, people you don't know later on. Uh, run contests. This is kind of a gray area. I'm okay with it. We've done it in our business where we'll kind of do a contest of like, hey, give us a review. We don't tell them obviously to write a five star or anything like that. Like give us a review and the first you know, 25, we'll give like a $100 Amazon gift card or we'll give some extra points in our loyalty program or something like that. I think it's okay. Other people will say, you know, maybe that's an incentivized review. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's up to you. Uh, but that seems to work very well. Uh, turn one review into many. This is what I was talking about. If you get it in one format, use it in different formats. Uh, you can just literally have somebody holding the bag at one point. Below, you could have their text plus the photo. Uh, another place, you could just have the text. And if you get them on video, you can do basically all three or four of those. Another way to kind of multiply that very quickly. And then capture transformations. Like typical review format, ideally, if you can get it, especially on video, is what was my life like before? What was my experience using this product? And then what's my life like after? Uh, that basic transformation is kind of like, uh, in a nutshell, what you want from reviews. So if you can capture that, that's great. So third tool is scarcity. Induce a primal fear that makes people act today rather than never. Because there's a good chance that if somebody doesn't buy from you today, they're never coming back. They're busy, they're doing other things, they're clicking on other people's ads. Uh, they may buy somebody else's competing product, who knows? So there's a big reason to try to capture them today. This is for Amazing Selling Machine. We used to do like you know one or two launches a year. Um, the first day we would get 30% of people to join. Then in the middle five days, each day would be you know a third of the signups uh, uh, total during those five days. So they're just kind of trickling in. The last day, after we've been talking about the freaking thing for two or three weeks, put out all the videos, all the ads, all the webinars, all the affiliates, all the everything, people are like, oh, you know what I should do? I should sign up today. This is a great idea. It would all come on the last day, on the last 24 hours. There is so much, was that you? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, we were we were literally. Oh, except for this. Oh, that's right. Yeah, times have changed, you know. <laughs> uh, but we would literally send an email. Um, cause I think a lot of times doors would close at like two a.m. Uh, because you know we would do it Pacific time. We we're in Central, and so uh, we would send an email at one a.m. and then we would track the sales to that one a.m. email, and there would be a disproportionate number of people to how many people that email is going out to. It's insane. And so what we learned from this, and I use this in every business, is that that last piece of scarcity, if you're gonna try to drive sales at anything with any bit of effort, maximize that scarcity towards the end. Um, I'm trying to remember why the hell I have this photo in here. <laughs> yeah, so scarcity is the basically sort of um, the fear that something's gonna be taken away. Uh, we tend to, it's something called the endowment effect. There's something that we tend to value something more once we own it. Scarcity kind of works the same way. It's like as soon as you tell people like, hey, this deal is gonna be taken away from you, then all of a sudden people kind of like freak out psychologically. Um, once again, kind of going back to our built-in wiring. So uh, Amazon uses this all the time. And so they're obviously one of the biggest companies in the world. So anything we can learn from them is a good idea. Uh, we're definitely not smarter than Amazon. <laughs> they're doing something right over there. So limited time deal, they're using this all the time. We should use the same kind of thing for our store um, as much as we can, only 13 left in stock. We don't have this kind of thing engineered into our Shopify store, but it's not a bad idea. Most of our products we kind of sell all the time. Um, we want to get away from, just as a side note, from using so many landing pages for all of our different products. For our main ones, sure. But for all the other variations and all that, we just want to make our product pages as good as possible because it makes life easier, more efficient. And so this would be a perfect thing for us to engineer in there because we have like flavor releases that literally are limited. 
And so any way we can use this kind of thing, super important. Amazon knows this drives more sales. We should be doing the same thing. Um, you know, this is the, you know, people waiting in line for the iPhone. Uh, some people, I guess, apparently even paid homeless people $35 to wait in line to get their iPhones, which is insane. People wanted the phone as soon as it was, soon as it was being released. It's the same idea of scarcity. So this is something I talk with Mike about <laughs> every time we have any promotion for anything, is we need to be able to answer why buy this thing now. Anytime we're ever doing any promotion, if we're gonna send an email to customers to buy something, if we're gonna have a landing page for customers to buy something, we need to be able to answer, why should I buy this thing today as opposed to tomorrow? If we can't answer that, we're probably gonna miss out on a significant amount of sales. If we can't answer that, then we're sort of ticking those boxes. Um, when it comes to growing your business, there's a few boxes to tick. It's obviously like, if you're selling majority on Amazon, maximize that channel. If you think you've got products that can work on Shopify with sales funnels, all that kind of stuff, you gotta tick all these boxes. Um, all the sort of contrast, the scarcity, the social proof. We've talked before last time, and happy to get into it later if y'all want. Increasing average order value. As long as you're ticking all those boxes, and if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then maybe it's because you gotta go back to the drawing board on the product or something, which is fine. Um, but you gotta tick all those boxes. Because I think if you do all this stuff, then you're good. You've covered like 90% of the sales you're gonna get. I think if you're going too far beyond this, you're probably pushing ethical and sort of legal boundaries, which some people do, which I don't think we should. It's just not worth the risk. Um, so these are the boxes you kind of have to tick. One of them is why should I buy this thing now? A powerful scarcity word that we use uh, is today. So you might be wondering, um, you know, we run our landing page. We pretty much have unlimited stock on our main products. Uh, and so one way to kind of make people think, like, is this deal gonna be available forever? Is this supply gonna be available forever? Is to say, today, you can get these bags at this discount. And we've tested different discounts, so this is not really dishonest, because if we could produce the same results at less of a discount, we would do that. we make more money, it's great. Um, but all trade-offs considered, uh, we can't. And so using this word is one way to kind of make people question a little bit, even on an evergreen landing page. If you have real scarcity, real supply limitations, use that, it's way better. But if nothing else, this is a way to kind of stack the odds in your favor a bit. Um, we use it again here. Use it all over the place. Use it more if I can find more places to use it. <clears throat> on Amazon, another way, limited inventory, we talked about that. Limited time discounts, also very important. Limited edition products. There's a company, John does jujitsu. I think he's slightly better than me. <laughs> Significantly better. Uh, there's a brand called Shorter Roll, and their whole business model, from what I can tell, is they come up with like limited edition geese, and they post on social media, hey, we got this new color or whatever coming out. They sell out immediately. And that's their whole, you got these guys buying four, five, six, seven geese, like mediocre people like me that do jujitsu, that just do it as like a hobby. They're buying all these things because I think they kind of drive them to a frenzy. They're like, I'm never gonna be able to get this again. Um, we, the most yeah, they're the most expensive also. Interesting model uh, where everyone else is selling the same stuff, but they're just kind of available for Evergreen. I don't think they do as well. So we do this with limited edition products. It's great. So we got some products that we only do in limited stock, uh, like some of these premium like Lux ones. So as you can see, it says add me to the waiting list. We do this in like limited runs and it works good. I mean, some of these products will sell for $50 a bag. Um, and they're unique kind of rare coffees that literally are in limited supply around the world and that kind of thing. Charles was manages that side. Uh, but we do these kind of runs and it's another great way. It gives you an excuse to communicate with your customers. So if you do like a regular promotion, that's fine. If you do one of these like right afterwards or before, there are, people aren't gonna be, oh, you're communicating with me too much. Cause you're like, hey, we got a limited number of these, take it or leave it. They're like, okay, uh, I don't want it, but I'm not gonna unsubscribe. Um, so it's another excuse to communicate with your customers. You're gonna ask a question? Yeah, what, what do you guys use for that? That's a good question. I'll have to find out. I can find out. I don't know. Yeah, we need to add something like that to our store. Yeah. Yeah, I can find out. I can text our person on the break. So. Um, as far as, as far, in terms of today, we increased um, on the top of our website, it's like free shipping for orders over 100. Yeah. And then we increased our, our free shipping 25%, and we just added free shipping today for orders over 125. Yeah, that's good. And we didn't see any drop in sales or anything. That's so cool. Yeah, perfect. Good example. What's up? Uh, yeah, that's real. Yeah. That's like, yeah. Like, okay. I mean, some people, like, I don't know, this is not me, but like Mike or somebody will know. It's like people were doing this thing where they would like reserve inventory, so it always looked like it was running out. Uh, that's probably not a good strategy. It doesn't work anymore. 
Yeah, Miguel says not a good idea, so don't do that. Um, easiest way to drive more sales, like I said, double down when a promotion is ending or if you're almost out of stock of something. Anytime you feel like you're almost out of stock of something and you want to move some extra units, let people know. Uh, great way, because that scarcity is going to drive people that have been sitting on the fence or thinking about it. Or they may think like, oh, they're almost out of stock. People must really like this product. I should give it a try. So anytime you have a promotion ending or you're almost out of stock, that's when it's time to double down, not let off. Um, if you had like a five-day promotion and say you sent like an email on day one, a handful of emails on day two, three, four, I would send at least two on the last day because that's going to be where you're going to get most bang for your buck. Put it on your website, put a banner, put a countdown timer, do all that kind of stuff. Anytime you have stock running out or when a promotion's ending, it's time to double down. So the tools we talked about, contrast, using what people don't expect to increase sales, uh, social proof, make buying from you the normal thing for people to do, and scarcity, induce a primal fear that makes people act today rather than never. Want to reiterate? Uh, I guess this is from Spider-Man. I didn't realize that until I looked this up. Uh, kind of corny. I'm not the biggest fan of Spider-Man, I guess, but... <laughs> I didn't before I looked it up. <laughs> I knew the quote. That's what I was looking for. I was like, this is Spider-Man, really? Um, so anyways. <laughs> yeah, it must have been Warren Buffett, yeah. <laughs> uh, but with great power comes great responsibility. And I absolutely believe this. I mean, like I said, I mean, I use this basically to get out of $100,000 in American Express credit card debt because I learned how to communicate with people to get them to buy more stuff. Um, I've used this to create lots of wealth. I've used this to get you all here whether you like it or not. Um, <laughs> but I've also used it for sometimes when I was just miserable because I was selling stuff I didn't believe in, pushing the limit on some of that stuff, and that does not make me happy. That's not what I'm here for. Uh, so these tools can be used to change your life, can be used to change your customer's life, help a lot of people, all that sort of stuff. But you always got to think, like, would I buy this thing if I was on the other end? And that means your actual product. That also means the message and how you're marketing it and your, everything about your brand. And I think everyone sort of is in that position, but it's always a good reminder because sometimes when you get these things working really well, natural tendency is wanted to push the limit. And so always keep that in mind, but these tools work. And thank you. Great.